Hello and welcome to The Hearing. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's album, just a quick recommendation for you. Um, because I saw them on YouTube recently and I realized you might really like them. A band called Dirty Loops. They're a d- dance pop group that are basically the prog equivalent of that. Huh. Dirty Loops, you say? Dirty lo- in... L- Loops. L-O-O-P-S. Loops. Okay. Imagine... Like, and this is a offhand analogy. I don't know if it really fits, but like ELO level musicianship with like Stevie Wonder kind of music. Wow, that sounds weird. No, not maybe not Stevie thought. Wonder's quality of songwriting exactly, but that kind of vein, kind of soul well, yeah. pop vein with like a ridiculous musicianship. And Stevie and, Wonder's one of those guys that's like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, what era Stevie are we talking about? <laughs> 80s Stevie. Okay. 80s Stevie with like prog musicianship and they like to show off their musicianship because you love prog but you also you're kind of tired of rock you want to look into other genres so worth checking out see if you like them i mean if you think about it the early 70s stevie he is flirting with prog oh yeah that's why i I want to point out 80s (laughs) okay (laughs) because his 70s (laughs) stuff was brilliant i mean you know songs in the key of life is a fucking masterpiece we need to review that Um, yeah anyway on to this week's album, which is from 1978, Blue Valentine by Tom Waits. Tom Waits is an American singer, songwriter, musician, composer, and actor, best known for his deep, gravelly voice and his lyrics, which often focus on the underbelly of society. He worked primarily in jazz during the 70s, but his music since uh, the 80s has reflected a greater influence from blues, rock, vaudeville, and experimental genres. Wait, Blue Valentine is Waits' fifth studio album. It was released on September 5th, 1978 on Asylum Records, produced by Bones Howe and features Tom Waits on vocals, electric guitar, and acoustic piano, Ray Crawford, Roland Batista, uh, I wonder if you really did Dave, um, Alvin Shrine Rob- Robbins, and Alvin Shrine Robinson on electric guitar, Scott Edwards, Jim Hughart, and Brian Miller on bass, or By- Byron Miller, sorry, on bass, Willie Daganga, aka George Duke, on electric uh, grand piano, um, Her- Harold Batiste, Batista and Batiste, both drummer names. The first one was a guitar player. This one's a piano player. Interesting. Um, Charles Kynard on organ, Herbert Hardinsky, Hardisky, oh, sorry, Herbert Hardesty, Frank Vicari on tenor sax, Rick Lawson, Earl Palmer, and Chip White on drums, Bobby Hall Porter, remember Bobby Hall from the... Um, uh, Bill Withers album we did. Uh, she yeah. plays congas on Romeo is Bleeding, and Bob Alvacar on orchestra. Um, remember, just a reminder: we don't. I reminder: I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons. But down in the description and on our blog at johnandscotto.com, you'll find links to find Blue Valentine, Blue Valentine on Spotify and YouTube, so you can listen along if you'd like. On to track one. Pretty much the entire reason I chose this album of his to review. <laughs> somewhere, yes, the somewhere from West Side Story. It's a very old Hollywood arrangement. Right. Um, you know, I've never been a Sondheim guy, but mm-hmm. I mean, I guess West Side Story is is forgivable, you know. <laughs> I'm not a Broadway guy in general, but I've always loved this song. Um, yeah, yeah. A, I mean, I don't know if I needed a Tom Waits version of it, though. It's an acquired taste, as is Waits' voice. I have to admit, I was I didn't appreciate Tom Waits until very recently, like within the last six months. Um, oh, really? Uh, Talos and Jaffe from Critical Role mentioned him in a, in a short interview, um, and it, basically just saying like those artists you kind of have to love. And I went back and listened to him, and I fell in love with his music. Um, Because I heard him back in the 90s, and I just didn't get it. He's one of those musicians, like Vernon Reed, and even Jimi Hendrix, I have to admit, unfortunately, who I didn't really get until my 40s. Well, I mean, I've always, I've kind of had him as a greatest hits kind of person, and not not an album person. Mm -hmm. And, I mean... Because he's all over the place, as as we'll see with the cell phone. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I love that about him. Um, but 
you know, unconventional musicians like Waits and, and Vernon and, and Hendrix. Um, I was a very trained musician. I had a very conventional way of thinking. I've kind of broken out of that in recent years, and now I'm learning to appreciate people who are a little outside of it. Um, I love the mix of his voice with this arrangement. It's so wrong that it's right. Right. Uh, you do get, you have to listen to it a few times, and then you start seeing the desperation yeah. in, in in his voice when he's singing this. And that... it does give it a very theatrical kind of feel. Yeah. I have Broadway here, but not really Broadway, but very theatrical. <laughs> um, it's, it's um, you know, I was kind of thinking, like, did Louis Armstrong ever cover this? Because <laughs> he should have, and I don't think he did. Maybe I might have been thinking of Buster Poindexter, actually. Because, I mean, um, they're all the same kind of but... gravel you know, pit. But when he drops the gravel here and there, which Waits does, you can see he he's actually stone. a really great singer. Of course. He's got a beautiful voice. He's just, the ga the gravel, I love it, but I have to admit it's an affectation. Yeah. Um, love the, the moments when he drops it, it re are really striking. The jazz trump trumpet also doesn't really fit like the old Hollywood arrangement, but I also love that because that's m more along the lines of Waits. You know, it's his world and this old Hollywood world, world old Hollywood world kind of clashing. Yeah, it's it's an interesting experiment. I'm just not sure if I'm on board for this one. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I have to admit, I chose this for this song because it is a mindfuck. I, I mean, it, it's obviously here to sell the album, you know, mm -hmm. to get that somewhere you know yeah. oh you see him doing that song and they'll people pick it up yeah on to track two red shoes by the drugstore now this is classic weights now this is more like it <laughs> great bass groove spoken vocal nice you know this chirpy guitar and this keyboard that are wonderfully off kilter uh i love when he occasionally holds a note which he doesn't do in a lot of right. songs um, and like a lot of songs on this one, it's very repetitive, but mm -hmm. when Waits does it, it works for me. Okay, because yeah, it's actually in my notes. I'm like, he's very repetitive. I'm not sure if you're going to like this. <laughs> That's the thing, because I normally <laughs> rail against repetition. But in wait, in the case of a Waits song, most of his songs, it's the band just finds a groove, yes. and then he tells a story. Exactly. I, the repetition is part of... It's a, a, almost a way of hypnosis. It's almost yeah. you know it, to draw you into a trance, to to draw you into this completely screwball world of his. Yeah, yeah. And and it, that that's what the song embodies. And it's that, that those primal drums and mm -hmm. just this whole thing. This I'm with. <laughs> like <laughs> this is what I signed up for for Tom Waits' album. On to track three. Christmas card from a hooker in Minneapolis. There is that is the epitome of a Tom Waits song title. You know what's funny? Here's when I put my notes for this. It's like a musical version of Nighthawks. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah. Not realizing that he actually the album before this, I believe, or a couple albums before this, <laughs> was actually called right. Nighthawks. Right. But this and is just course, a mellow, bluesy song. It's just piano, electric piano, and vocal. It's great drinking music. I think that's Waits in general. It's great right. drinking music. When when you move to Chicago and you live in Chicago, Hopper and Nighthawks uh -huh. is is I mean okay, that, yeah, that's yeah. the hometown uh -huh. thing. I mean, there's my the bar in the last neighborhood I lived in was actually called Nighthawks. It was oh wow, you know the whole. <laughs> so was that based on a diner in Chicago? Uh, you know what? They there's debate about what it is because he kept it generic. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, whether it was something in New York or something in Chicago, okay. but you know, this is this is Hopper Country, so we're mm. gonna say it's in Chicago. <laughs> but this song Christmas Card feels almost a bit Elton John. Right, like early Elton John yeah. though. Like, or, good Elton John. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. And I loved the line, um, everyone used to say Everyone I used to know is either dead or in prison, so I came back to Minneapolis. <laughs> this time I think I'm going to stay. <laughs> That's Tom Waits. This, is, this, again, is what Waits does. It's just a very simple arrangement and a story. You know? And I'm not typically a fan of story songs. 
Yeah, I've never liked Springsteen. Um, I like it a, a little bit of Bon Jovi. He did the story song thing. It's oh, just not my like, thing, typically. We don't but... like those guys because we're from New Jersey and we had those guys shoved down our fair throats. Fair point, fair point. Um, those are the only two story singer songwriters. Dylan. I'm not a Dylan fan. I have to explain that to people out here. That it's like, wait, you don't like Springsteen? Yeah. Like, we cause... As- it's assumed that if you're from Jersey, you like Springsteen. A certain kind of person in Jersey likes Springsteen. We had to put up with these middle-aged people like going Bruce yeah. for for years, and it was just like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I worry sometimes that I'm that middle-aged guy, but with like drama, drama, and the smithereens. Ah, you know, no, because we're not like you gotta like this. You well, gotta listen fair. to that's this. Fair. You know, we, we're right. we're not doing that no, no. To, to kids. I mean, we're just kind of like, ah, if you're into it, all right. Mm-hmm. You're, the stuff you're into is kind of shitty, though. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of story songs. Like, Dylan just released a new one. It's epic in length. I don't remember exactly. It's like 20-something minutes long. Uh, yeah. Something and it's crazy. like just a story. Yeah, the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. like, whoa, something more about the 60s. That's yeah, a yeah. very un- unexamined time period <laughs> in our history. Thank but you, Bob. When Waits tells a story, I'm into it. Yeah. Well, of course, he's a compelling storyteller. Yeah, yeah. I don't think those other guys really are, honestly. No, no. I, you know, and this might this will draw ire, I'm sure, but I think Dylan is, you know, has always thought he was more clever than he was. Yeah. You know, there's always been, that's always kind of irked me. <laughs> I and then you know we are the the following generation, so maybe that's why we think so. But yeah, I've always felt Dylan a bit, a bit overrated. I, and I mean. And, you say I'm I'm wrong, but the motherfucker took the name Dylan Thomas. Come on, right? Yeah, he was no Dylan Thomas. No, no. <laughs> on to track four, Romeo is bleeding. The movie, by the way, was named after the song. That's what I thought. Yeah, this is another change of pace. Um, great groove. This is the one uh, Bobby Hall shows up on Bobby Hall Porter, um, the playing Congress. Um, great this is groove. What I wrote bass, about the repetition. Of <laughs> yeah, it's it's a repetitious story song. <laughs> and I just want the groove and the story to keep going. Yeah. You know? This is like I said, this is this is what you listen to when you got a bottle of whiskey or liquor <laughs> of your choice. And you're just sitting there, it's on in the background, you're not paying attention to it. It I, I, there's like a song later in the album where I just describe that you just melt into it. Mm-hmm. And it melts into you. Yeah, it's yeah. it's crazy how it works. And I love how the sax solo is mo- mostly uses traditional harmony, but he goes off the rails here and there. Gets really harm, you know, uh, jazzy, and and I mean in the like bebop sense, every once in a while. Um, now on to track five, twenty nine dollars. This is a very close second favorite of mine. It's more of a traditional blues song. It's just a straight blues song. Yeah. Love the bass playing on the entire album. This one, he reminds me a little of Muddy Waters. Right. And it kind of reminded me that I hadn't really listened to blues in a while. I mean, I listened to it a lot when I first mm-hmm. moved out here because, I mean, it's Chicago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I listened to it a lot more actually when I was in New Jersey, just driving around mm-hmm. all day long and like ah let's listen to something different for a change yeah. i mean I'm the, I'm the guy who would pull into the occ parking lot blasting lightning hopkins but i also <laughs> did that with bach and jazz and whatever um love but i love the blues um yeah love muddy uh weights also reminds me a little bit of lightning hopkins who is another one of my absolute favorites old school okay. acoustic blues player who also like told stories um Again, second my my second favorite on the album. This this is why I love blues songs like this. Um, love the kind of stack style guitar on it too. Yeah, so one thing is not really traditional. It's like a stack guitar, um, and the blues song is the longest song on the album. Right, this was the one where I actually thought felt I just it just melted into me. <laughs> it's really weird how it just gets in your head. And then you kind of get into it. It's yeah. uh, and, and the the screaming bit at the end was a little weird. Well, obviously, it was influenced by uh, Screaming Jay, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah. Um, 
But and I mean, we, saying it's weird in a, in a Wade song, I would normally be here for weirdness. <laughs> but on such a straight blue song, it just didn't quite. That little bit didn't quite work for me. But beyond that, it's fucking amazing. Now he goes a little off for me. Um, track six, wrong side of the road. Great groove. Um, not, again, repetitive, a little variation in the chords, but the whole shtick is getting a little old for me at this point. I kind of thought this was the best use of his voice, though. Um, I mean, if you're you're taking it out of context from the album, which mm, yeah, maybe why it's uh, I think he's better suited for like a best of than an entire album. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that growl. I mean. <laughs> And I think it's it's another bluesy one, which I think the issue for me is it's another bluesy song right after the straight up blues song that I fucking loved. Yeah. So it just paled by comparison. I mean, it's an okay song. Like there is no bad song on this album. It's just it was a victim of where it was placed. Um, there's some nice unexpected slapping on the bass, which is not normally my thing, but I like it in small doses. I think I've gone on record saying I'm a bass player who's against slapping. Um, <laughs> Love how the sax kind of plays a counterpoint to Waite's voice. Um, again, yeah, it's just, it was, it can't compare to $29, so it, it ended up being my pick for weakest. On to track seven, Whistling Past the Graveyard. Love this use of the Hoochie Coochie Man riff. You got to, uh, if you're doing a Halloween playlist, this has to be on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was originally my pick for weakest. But then, like, ten minutes after I finished the review, it was in my head and I had to come back and listen to it. <laughs> so I think I felt the same way me. about Red Shoes by the Drugstore. Uh-huh. I was kind of like, eh. And then, like, on the second listen, I was like, holy shit, this is good. <laughs> same with Roby was bleeding. Uh-huh. I love how high and frantic his voice gets in this one, too. He really pushes the envelope with that. Um, I just still want, I just wanted something not bluesy at this point. And the repetition was getting a little annoying. And then we get to track eight, Kentucky Kentucky Avenue. This is the change <laughs> I wanted. It's just this mellow, you know, just acoustic piano. And I love it when he does the gravel softly. I think this is very similar to uh, Somewhere, actually. Uh, oh, I, but, yeah. I think, musically at least. Mm-hmm. I think this would have been stronger if he hadn't done that cover to lead in Maybe. and this was just like this coming from out of nowhere to be like wait what <laughs> <laughs> i love this soft gravel um and how many songs reference macadamia nuts <laughs> well leave it to waits <laughs> <laughs> and while i'm on the, the the subject of the the oddball lyrics his the references there's a reference to a person in a wheelchair at the end of the song a little uncomfortable with that. Um, I'm in a wheelchair for those who don't know. Um, so that was a little un- awkward. Um, but I love his voice on this one. And it's a great recovery after the two that were victims of fo- having to follow $29. I'll put it that way. <laughs> in isolation, good songs. Just not really good after $29. Um, I love the orchestra kind of creeping in. That was a very nice touch. On to track nine. Another classic Tom Waits title. A sweet little bullet from a pretty blue gun. <laughs> the percussive guitar makes a great snare at the beginning. It's a really solid groove. Wasn't expecting the little turn at the end of each phrase. Um, that it just adds a really nice twist. I kind of kept waiting for it to turn around into another section because it's you know going into a B section because it kind of leads that way, but it, it just yeah. repeats because it's some weights. Yeah, I think. I mean. It just didn't go around for me, you know. I mean, yeah, it, the repetition was getting tired, but I was closely listening to it. I was reviewing it. If I had this on in the background, that wouldn't bother me. Yeah, you know, if I had this on the background, I had that, you know, bottle or whatever, I'd be into it. And I think that is the point of this album. That's that's, mm-hmm. you know, you listen to somewhere and then drink up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, the title track, Blue Valentines. This is my favorite. I I say mine too. At least just for both vocal performance, it's just heartbreaking. It ends on a nice soft note with just Waits' voice and guitar. And Waits played guitar on this one. All of the oh, guitar. Yeah. 
No one else is credited with playing electric guitar on this track, um, which amazed me because he's a hell of a guitar player. Love the tone. It's this beautiful, clean. I think it's the Strat. Um, just the, and it's just this nice, intimate ending to the album with these beautiful lyrics. I don't have any quotes from it, but I remember really liking them. And this great solo, which again apparently waits. I was very impressed. Mm. It's a hell of a guitar. Yeah, part. I would have thought. I would have assumed that was a studio player yeah, too. I but... mean, the rhythm part, sure, I can buy that as waits. But apparently, nobody else is credited with playing guitar on track ten. So I got to assume that Waits played that solo, which is beautiful. All but right, of course, so... the main draw is just that that yeah. vocal performance. Yeah. Oh, he that's gives. that's Waits. It's his stories Jesus. and his voice. Well, yeah. I mean, he he does varied performances throughout the album. Mm-hmm. Some of it's just insane. Like there's there are two spectrums, like the yeah. Louis Armstrong, right. you know, or you know the. <laughs> well, the, in, the terms, lighter. in terms of vocal performance, it's out and out Louis Armstrong, or it's soft and kind of clean. And then in terms of songs, it's it's two ends too, because it's just ridiculous and insane, or it's really. So, calm and intimate but yeah kind of just beautiful yeah so would you recommend it i would i would definitely yeah of course i mean it's it's tom waits what is there to not recommend i don't think i'd i think i'd still be like a greatest hits kind of listener to him uh-huh. instead of an album but uh yeah yeah i would definitely recommend checking this out too yeah, same here um all right so until next time we'll be reviewing the juliet letters by elvis costello quite a change of pace for him. We might have to do two Elvis Costello albums. Yeah. Because this is the one he did with the string quartet. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.